I got the recording going. All right, uh, greetings, brothers. Uh, we don't have any sisters on tonight. Uh, it is February, no, February, March 1st, 2022. Uh, this will be session 22. This is our last session of um, our officers training. Um, tonight we'll be reading, uh, finishing up lesson 21, uh, which is the history of UNIA. And then uh, briefly going over lesson 22, which is titled the five-year plan. Um, so uh, as always, before we start uh, we're on the roll, uh, all we have right now tonight is myself, Brother John, Division 421, um, uh, Division 106 uh, President uh, Everett, and Division 106 um, Brother Bruce, are you an officer at 106? Yes, sir. All right, and Brother Bruce. So it's three of us on the call tonight. Um, small group. Last class, uh, it's the dedicated group, you know, um, but um, really respect, uh, you know, finishing this thing to completion. Um, I think the last time the UNIA as a whole tried to do a training with this course, uh, we only made it to lesson 11. Um, that's halfway through the book. So, um, this is the first time uh, that I'm aware of the full course being uh, at least read, um, and we'll have questions and everything um, since 2018 or 19 when I um, first took this course. But without further ado, we got a couple questions. Well, no, no, pledged to wear back the green flag. <clears throat> you would uh, take the mic on mute and repeat after me. Uh, find a red, black, and green flag. It's black fist in air. I commit my body, mind, and spirit. I commit my body, commit mind, my and body, spirit. mind, and spirit. To the protection, defense, and security. To the protection, protection defense, defense, and security. Security. Of the red, the black, and the green. Of the red, red the black, black, and the green. I dedicate my life to the redemption of Mother Africa. I dedicate, I dedicate my, my life, life to the redemption, redemption of Mother Africa. Africa. And the liberation of her scattered black children. And the liberation, and the liberation of, of, scattered, of, black of children. scattered black children. I accept for myself and my descendants. I accept for myself and my descendants. And my descendants. The teachings of universal African nationalism. The teachings of teachings universal, of African, universal nationalism. African Africanism. Um, and Brother Bruce, I understand your work, so if you can't, you know, I understand that. Um, and I promise that our children will be instilled. And I promise, and I promise that, our that our children will be instilled, will be instilled with the purpose and knowledge of themselves as African people. With the purpose, the purpose and, and knowledge, knowledge of, of themselves, themselves as African, African people. people. In order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail. In order that, that the cause, cause of, of our, our struggle, struggle will neither falter, will neither falter, neither falter fail. nor fail. Until all black people are free and united until, Until all, all black, black people, people are free and united. united through one God, through one, one God, God, one aim, one aim, one destiny, one destiny. One destiny. Race first. Race first. So I just have a couple questions from uh, last week's reading. I don't have them. Um, they're not documented, but. Uh, what is the purpose of the organization of the UNIA ACL? What is the purpose? According to uh, Lesson 21, because the purpose seems to, it can change depending on uh, what lesson we're in, what we're reading, uh, what the aims and things are. But according to the last, last lesson, uh, what is the purpose of the organization? What was stated? If you don't know, just tell me you don't know. Okay. Um, purpose of the organization is uplift um, our race. 
a big part of it. Universal Negro Improvement Association African Communities League was conceived as an organization with the purpose of raising the status of the Negro to national expression and general freedom. In the year 1913, during the visit of Marcus Garvey to Europe, after he had completed the venturous visit uh, to the Central American Republics. Um, purpose of raising the status of the Negro to national expression and general freedom. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about our one aim, uh, it's to have a independent, sovereign uh, nation on the uh, motherland of Africa, um, but for all of our people uh, within the race. But Hey, hey Brother John, purpose. say that again for me. Which one? The the one you just um you just gave the um the purpose the of the. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we just yes, see, I, I can see, I can see it. Okay, so in lesson twenty one, in the beginning, um, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was conceived as an organization for the purpose of raising the status of the Negro to national expression and general freedom, um, national expression, general freedom, um, nationality. Um, that's what we're talking about. We're trying to create uh, a form of nationality that's global. Uh, so it's, it's kind of weird when we talk about nations and nations are a piece of the globe, but um, Garvey was presenting a, a form of nationality uh, that could be accepted by anyone in the race no matter where they are in the world. But nationality and freedom for our people. Okay, that's the purpose. Next question is, what was the... What were the two organizations that Garvey approached uh, to get help? when he um, started to organize the, or build the UNIA in the United States. What were the two groups that he uh, went to for help? Um, NAACP. Yep. I want to say Tuskegee. That might, that might be wrong. I know he went to Tuskegee. Was that the Tuskegee, Tuskegee um, Institute? Was, that, was it the Tuskegee Institute? They were a big organization during that time. Correct. Yeah, that was Tuskegee. It? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, Tuskegee and NAACP. Um, okay. Yeah. That was a very big institution right there. Was that? That was a very big institution, the Tuskegee um, institution. Um, yeah. They, they had the airmen, all that stuff going on. Um, Garvey met with Principal Robert R. Moulton, Professor E.J. Scott, Secretary Treasurer, discussed with them the purpose of the organization. Uh, which was similar to the present aims and objects of the UNIA, um, which have been written in the UNIA Constitution. So here he was discussing with the Tuskegee, and then right after he talks about uh, visiting W.E.B. Du Bois and um, NAACP. Um, and both groups um, didn't really give Garvey encouragement. Um, What does it mean to know the UNIA? What do you, what must we do or, yeah, what must we do in order to know the UNIA? This is in the section called how to teach the UNIA. But in order to know the UNIA, what must we do? Or what must we know? That's a tricky uh, one. Um, in order to know, what do you mean by no? Like with the like the aims and objectives, or to know the in UNIA. The, in, the text, in the text, it uses the words. It, it says, "To know the UNIA, you must first do something." And this is in the section. This is the first words uh, in the section called "How to Teach the UNIA." So as representatives of the UNIA, if we, could, if we call ourselves representatives of the UNIA, uh, according to Garvey, what information was, must we have uh, in order to teach the UNIA or be 
proper representatives of you and I. You got me on that one, brother. I, I, I really, really want to say, um, um, I really want to say, um, uh, um, know your people, you know, um, try to, um, I, I don't know exact words that are in there, but I, I mean, most it's definitely. The I'm sorry, brother Bruce. It's the Constitution, yeah. right? Okay. I, I understand what brother Bruce is saying. Um, knowing your people. Um, <clears throat> to an extent, um, but the UNIA is, is supposed to be a idealized representation of our people. Um, so not just looking at us where we are or um, some of our negative history, but projecting um, what our possibilities could be. Um, and, and a lot of our people, uh, you know, they're not really there yet, to, to, to be blunt. <clears throat> but uh, Brother Everett, you did say something. What were you saying in regards to how to teach the UNA? Oh, yes, my bad. Um, I believe it's the Constitution and the Book of Laws or something like that. If, if that's what you're talking about. It's either that yeah. or aims, objectives, and preamble, but I think it's the Constitution. Constitution is a part of, is, well, the preamble is part of the Constitution, so those are the same. Um, but Garvey says to know the UNIA, uh, to know what the UNIA is, you must first read its Constitution and Book of Laws from cover to cover. Um, has anyone in this room read, or in, on this call read the Constitution and Book of Laws from cover to cover? I've read, I've read some it, of it. I, I, mean, yes, I haven't I've read, read it all. I understand. My point, I haven't either. Um, my point is we have work to do. Um, and until we uh, do that work, According to Garvey, you know, we're not properly representing the UNIA. Um, and, and, and I say that um, regardless of what any other division is doing or um, on a parent body level. Um, this is Garvey's words, you know, and for me, this goes beyond uh, any of his, 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 his students' words or any of, you know, our current um, offices of leadership. Um, what someone else says we have to do to know the UNIA is their opinion, and that's valid, and it, you know, it may be constitutional, whatever. But Garvey, in his words, says uh, to know the UNIA, to know what the UNIA is, you must first read the Constitution and Book of Laws from cover to cover. So if people are not reading the Constitution and Book of Laws from cover to cover, and then they're telling you, you know, these are the things that you need to do uh, to know the UNIA and to represent the UNIA. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're being misled, <clears throat> in my opinion. Um, so the foundation of this organization, of this government um, is the constitution, this book of laws, um, which the aims and objectives are included in that. Um, and, and honestly, when you, this, this statement can be confusing, but, the Constitution and Book of Laws is one document. Um, um, the general laws is, 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 is within the Constitution. So when you look at the Constitution, it's broken up into different sections. Uh, and one of the sections is Constitution. Uh, the second section is general laws. But that one document um, includes the Constitution and Book of Laws. And then he also says, you must also read the literature written by the founder bearing on the activities of the organization. Um, that's not super clear for me. Um, I know that there is, there are several documents. Let me see. Wait. Also to read literature written by the founder. Okay. So if it's written by the founder, that means the only things that are written by Garvey. So there may be a lot of documents, you know, written by secretaries, meeting minutes and things like that. Um, but it's literature written, um, by Garvey himself. And I, for me, that includes philosophies and opinions. Um, which were his books, I mean, not his books, but his speeches, and um, 
I guess selected writings and speeches is just a, a copy of uh, philosophies and opinions. And it's, it's like in a, a chronological order, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So constitution, um, philosophies and opinions, um, we gotta know these books cover to cover. You know, if we claim to be representatives and anybody else out in the street, you know, that's claiming to be a representative of the UNIA or Garvey or the red, black and green flag, uh, they should know the constitution and books of laws cover to cover. Uh, and if they don't, in my opinion, uh, they're not legitimately representing uh, the organization according to message to the people. Any questions or comments on that? Um, what was the purpose of the preamble of the constitution? Anybody? Purpose of the preamble of the Constitution. So you know what um, the preamble is. I'm going to say it is to um, the purpose that you said the purpose of the preamble, right? Yes. I don't got the exact words. So I'm going to say it is pretty much to sum up what the UNIA is, like friendly, social, humanitarian. It's eight of them. Um, so I would say to, I wanna say to, to show um, what the UNIA is, what the UNIA is about. You can uh, I always say to send people to the preamble, but I could be off. Not a bad, a, um, is, not, not a bad uh, answer. Um, a preamble is supposed to be a short summary of what the UNIA is about. Um, and we're supposed to use it for two purposes. One is to, uh, as a recruiting tool for our people. Um, and then the second purpose is where I was going with the, with the text. The preamble was written specifically, especially for the purpose of winning the sympathy and support of alien races. Uh, where the other objects of the association are being threatened by hostility. So um, it is for us and it is for our people, um, but it's also a defense tool. So if, if anybody comes at the UNIA and says, oh, this is a hate group, it's a terror group, you guys you know, hate white people or hate anybody that's not like you, we go straight to the uh, preamble and we say, no, um, this is what we stand for. This is what we are uh, about and this is how we defend uh, rep rep reputation of the organization. I'm trying to get the um, constitution. Um, this is important. I mean, I didn't plan on you know doing it like this, but. When things come up uh, that are important and, and critical, we want to take the time to make sure we understand, well, review it at least. Uh, if we don't have a level of understanding, at least we have a level of awareness. Um, so preamble, preamble to the Constitution of the UNIA ACL. This has not been changed since the founding of the organization. Okay. Preamble states, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League is a social, friendly, humanitarian, charitable, educational, institutional, constructive, and expansive society, and is founded by persons desiring to the utmost to work for the general uplift of the Negro peoples of the world. And the members pledge themselves to do all in their power to conserve the rights of their noble race and to respect the rights of all mankind, believing always in the brotherhood of man in the fatherhood of God. The motto of the organization is one God, one aim, one destiny. Therefore, let justice be done to all mankind, realizing that if the strong oppresses the weak, confusion and discontent will ever mark the path of man. But with love, faith, and charity towards all, the reign of peace and plenty will be heralded into the world, and the generation of men shall be called blessed. Uh, we should memorize this, you know, as officers, 
I haven't memorized it uh, in, in three or four years, but um, my president, my yeah, my president, my Jagna, Ross Marvin has memorized it. Um, he's displayed that, you know, but we're, su we're supposed to be using this as a recruiting tool when we're going out into the communities and people say, what's the UNIA? You know, we can, you know, spit it verbatim, but we got to know it uh, to be able to do that. Questions, comments on uh, preamble? Okay. What's the difference between the UNIA and the ACL? We are the UNIA. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say that again, We are UNIA ACL. What is the difference between UNIA and ACL? Um, the UNIA, the ACL is supposed. Damn. Um, one is one. We, the UNIA is like a fraternity, and the ACL. Um. Ah. Uh, are you looking for one is how we, we, we I forgot one is how we do like business right when we do business is that the answer you're looking for you're looking for a different kind of answer no that's it um so yeah one of them was a fraternal organization the other was the business arm basically. all right okay cool all right you and I ACL was intended as one organization to carry out all the aims and objects of the constitution but the laws of the states in which the organization operates separates the function of friendly and fraternal organizations from those of business organizations. So friendly and fraternal, UNIA, friendly and fraternal, uh, ACL, business. Um, so the, at a time, these two had to split, um, but as of right now, they are they are one. Uh, the, organization, the organization had to be incorporated as Universal Legal Improvement Association, African Communities League, and African Communities League Incorporated. So this is separate. Um, UNIA was corporate as fraternal, ACL incorporated as business, so fraternal and business. That's, that's the correct answer. Convention of 1920. This is very important because this is where, um, basically, I've, I've talked to President Ross Marvin about this, um, and you'll hear, you know, as you talk to some of the other elders in the organization about the split um, that have happened in the UNIA. Um, but we hold fast to, uh, we come from the UNIA ACL that was created in the convention of 1920. So a lot of the splits that happened were in like the 40s, the 80s, and we had another one in, in 2020 or 2019, I think, or something like that. Yeah, 2019 and then 2020, they kind of um, did their own thing. Um, but Convention of 1920 uh, accepted the original idea that linked the two organizations together as the UNIA and ACL uh, hold principles that were intended so that the two organizations would not go apart as if they were not related. Uh, so based on the convention of 1920, the first international uh, convention uh, of Negro peoples of the world, that's where we brought the UNIA, ACL uh, back together as one whole uh, entity. Questions, comments on UNIA and ACL? Okay. Well, sir, you are clarifying a lot of little details and everything. Got me a lot of um, stuff I need to study, that's for sure. Um, Yes, this is a, I'm still studying myself, my brother. Like I said, I, I, I joined 2018. Um, I'm still studying, I'm uh, still learning. Um, this is a over a hundred year organization, um, over a hundred year government now. So there's a lot that we have to learn in regards to the history. Um, there's a lot that we have to learn in regards to the roles of the government uh, and people's different roles and responsibilities. Um, and, and, you know, the function uh, and the structure of the organization. So there's a lot to it, uh, but as Garvey said, and as we, as we previously read, um, to know the UNIA the best way is to get into that constitution. 
there's a lot of things that are documented in the Constitution. Um, us as members and officers, we don't really know about or follow. Um, but per the Constitution, that's the way things are supposed to function. Um, who are the private individuals that are allowed to own capital um, in the uh, UNI government? Who are the private individuals that are allowed to own capital within the UNI government? No one, correct? That no one? Correct. Okay. That's correct. It was a trick question. Uh, no private individuals are intended to own the capital of any of these enterprises because these enterprises were organized as future ones will be organized only for the purpose of supplying funds by way of profit to the UNIA, not to any individuals, uh, to carry out the aims and objects of the UNIA, not individual aims and objects as laid out in the Constitution of the UNIA. So uh, that's one thing, and Brother Evan, you probably are more familiar with this than anybody else on the call, but in regards to international headquarters um, that we've been working on, um, one thing, that, a question that I'm gonna have for the parent body is ownership uh, and paperwork, and, and um, is the building owned by individuals or is it owned by uh, officers within the organization? Because uh, that's something that Garvey kind of talked about in one of the earlier lessons. He says, like, yeah, when you have names tied to titles, when you have names tied to deeds, but you don't have officer titles tied to those deeds, um, that's when it becomes personal. Because when you have officer titles, um, as the officer, as you know, if somebody leaves that position and somebody else comes in, then the new officer now has. Uh, holds that authority, um, but that's how you get out of. We've had a lot of issues in the in the recent past where individuals uh, claim ownership of property, and this, you know, from Garvey seems to be a good way, uh, a good practice that we should have to eliminate um, individuals from owning property and and keeping ownership of that property after their uh, time in office has passed. Questions, comments on that? No, that was, um, you gonna bring that up at the ATC, Brother John, Cousin John? Um, I'm gonna probably, I mean, I'm probably bringing it up. That's a good, uh, that's, I was just saying, that's a phenomenal question to ask because um, that's a good question. Yeah, um, I'm gonna talk to, uh, I, may bring a, I may bring it up at the uh, president's meeting tomorrow. Um, you know, just, I don't know, kind of give them a heads up. Uh, like, hey, you know, I, I'm I'm looking, I'm interested to know what the paperwork looks like uh, for the ownership of the building and, and whose names and are, are listed and are they listed as individuals or officers? That's basically what I'm asking. But that's what I'm saying. Like, and I got to get into the Constitution because it says, you know, it's supposed to be something in the Constitution that uh, prevents individuals from owning things. You know, but I haven't really found that in the Constitution. Um, to carry out its aims and objects as laid on the Constitution. Yeah, I, I do remember. So I, I, I remember know. something you said. I don't know if it was you going over to a brother, a brother Roz at that time, but it was something about um, um, like for buildings or something. No one, no one person. It could have been a message to the people though, but one person shouldn't own a. a um, you know, should own property or something in the UNIA. It should always be by the UNIA, but I, I, I'm not sure where I saw that from. Yeah, it's, it's in. The, I know it's in the message. We, we went over it in the previous lesson, um, but the thing is, if it's not constitutional, if it's not in the Constitution, and that's, <clears throat> this is something that I ran into in 2019 during High Executive Council. Um, our previous president general, his name was Singo Baye. Uh, he was at High Executive Council and President General Michael Duncan was there as well. 
and there was a discussion. That was brand new, uh, so I'm I'm just you know a deer in the headlights, kind of like what 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 y'all talking about? Why y'all you know? But um, Dingo Baye was saying that message to the people. This book is supposed to supplement the Constitution. It's almost like uh, the spirit in the letter, you know, like like a lot of corporations do today, where the letter is the Constitution, and that's you know the letter of law. But how you carry out that uh, letter is through the spirit. Um, but if it's not documented that way, then we can have a case where you know if it's not written in the Constitution, some you know people in power can say, "Hey, this is the Constitution. This is what the Constitution says. Message to the people is not included in the Constitution, so forget everything that that says." Basically, that that can happen. <clears throat> but it really it comes down to what's in the constitution yeah this this is garvey's words this is La garvey's last political will and testament as the book says um, but these lessons are not necessarily uh, constitutional so there's a there's a little bit of a disconnect to where you know we can you know, and I've even thought about this where you can come into HEC or a convention and, you know, read directly from a message to the people, but be shot down because, you know, this stuff is not in the Constitution. But we have to be prepared for that. I got a question, brother. Go ahead. Um, so basically, property in, um, in a governmental type situation. This is like a, um, it would be set up in a trust. Is that how that works? It would be yes. set up in a trust and every officer yes. would be in that trust. And as that officer moved out of the position because the land or whatever, the building is in a trust, then that officer takes over that responsibility when he moves into that position. Am I, am, am I, got, I got that right? Absolutely. Yes, that's right. Okay. Hey, so hey this brother is John, corporation. I'm sorry, brother Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. So this is a no. corporation, right? Uh, we have to function as a corporation within right. uh, the geographical bounds of the United States. Right. Got you. We can't Got openly it. function as a, you know, as a government. Um, but since since the United States is capitalist, you know, if you pay your bills, you know, don't call yourself a government. You can do the exact same thing, you know, um, but just call yourself a corporation rather than the government. Is that, um, Brother John, I wanted to piggyback off what Brother Bruce said, because that was a good question he asked. Um, Go ahead. The charter, because I, I got to get the charter from um, Brother Kajana. Um, is that yes. kind of dealing with how we would like get a building or something? Does it go off the charter or is the char what is the charter actually? Because I've never gotten it from him. We, we never connected yet. The charter is just your, I mean, it's, it's, the charter is, is it's all internal. Um, that really, that has, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with uh, business interactions with the United States. Um, the charter okay. is, it's our internal um, legitimate, legitimate, legitimacy uh, process, I guess. Um, but it's it's a way of so it's a U and I eight it's a U and I eight thing, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's just a it's just a way to tell others that you've been recognized by the parent body as an official division. Got you. Okay. Uh, hey, brother, I, what is. what I was seeing, what I what I'm beginning to see is like. Um, they have different divisional um, structures when you come to a corporation. They have a, um, a divisional, actual divisional um, structure where they might have different regions, like they might have the North American region. And then you can have all kinds of offices in that, that region. And then you can have like the African region um, division. And then they have different um, sections in that, just like we got it set up. So, I mean, you can Google the actual structure and you can see some of it. And I'm thinking that's kind of exactly where we at right there. So anything done inside is um, inside of a corporation. Anything that we do is inside of a corporation. So we do have rights 
as a as a government or however we want to structure our our corporation and then inside of there any paperwork or anything that's generated by us is only um uh is bound to us inside of the corporation just like the united states government does with the military or any other entity that's attached to them i'm, I'm hoping that i'm saying that right but it, that's the way it looks like it looks like it's a straight up corporation with um different sections and anything done inside of that corporation is done internally. So any paperwork generated is done internally inside of that corporation. Thank you, right. Uh, that sounds right, Brother John. Yes, for the most part. Yes, yes. Um, yes, in, in general, but but I don't want them to limit it to, because when he, when he explained it, it sounds like there's no outside interaction. Um, but most of the corporate uh, interaction, as he was saying, um, would be internal within uh, the UNIA. Um, but there's also supposed to be an external communication uh, from the parent body or from the leadership of the corporation. They're supposed to have a relationship with, you know, these other nations. So United States, um, you know, European countries, um, they're supposed to have those relationships, and then we have our relationship with with our leadership. Does that make sense? To me? Yes. All right. Um, I don't know if I got any other. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of. Yeah, I'm not going to nitpick on this stuff. Let's see. Oh, hold on, I got another, it's following up on what we had just read. But again, this ain't necessary. oh, it's not in here. So this jumps from 169 to 173. But on page 171, Barbie says, never allow any division to have individuals owning the property of the division in their name, except in cases where proper documents have been passed or the organization is not registered as between the persons and the organization, showing that they are only holding such in trust for the organization. But all this should be discouraged and immediate steps taken to register the organization in a particular state or community so that its property may be held in its name. When property is bought in the name of the organization, the organization's name must be mentioned and only the names of the offices of the organization at that time must appear as offices, not as individuals. For instance, Brooklyn Division of UNIA, John Brown, President, Henry Jones, Secretary. Uh, in law, the names are taken as being officers of an organization. Hence, the individuals can make no separate claim on the property as individuals. Should they not continue as officers of the organization, those who then become officers of the organization, uh, organization would have their names substituted as officers. So, um, kind of, Brother Bruce, what you said um, in regards to ownership, uh, individuals, and trust, Garvey kind of laid it out within the book as well. I, I'm beginning to understand it a lot more now that you're breaking it down. Uh, it's basically a, like the UNIA is no different than the United States government. It's the only thing is that the United States government laid claim to an area, so they have um, gotten more backing and support. Now, if we get more backing and support, we could just be as just as powerful if we have the backing support because we have a constitution and we are organized just as the United States government would be. I, I'm getting it. Believe me, yes, I, I, I appreciate this, man. We just need a lot more yes, yeah, yeah. Um, effort going forward. Yes, the only, yeah, the um, excellent um, summation, the only difference between us and the, and the U.S. from a, uh, I guess, political standpoint, um, nationality standpoint, is, is, is land, you know, uh, and that that's not about how much land, it's just land if we had our own land, you know, outside of the United States where we didn't have to pay taxes to, um, that's when you basically 
you have your own nation. Uh, and, and once that nation is represented, or not represented, recognized by other nations, um, that's it, you know. So we've done all of the other work, you know, to be recognized as a government and a, as a nation. The only thing that we haven't done is, is gotten a piece of land, you know, for ourselves to say, you know, this is ours. We don't pay any taxes to anybody else. That's the one thing we're missing. All right, um, we got quite a bit to read. Uh, let me go ahead. We want to finish this. I got to read like a lot of pages. Let me get some water and I'm going to start reading. I run through this uh, in uh, 40 minutes, try to finish this up. All right, page 173, we are continuing uh, history of the UNIA. Next section is arguments for the continuation, per perpetuation, and support of the UNIA. Um, So hey, Brother John, um, I'm sorry to cut yeah. you off, Brother John, President John. Um, you know what? Um, this is uh, this chat, this part right here. Um, it's like, how, how, let me, let me, let me, let me get my thoughts together. So um, the preamble will be included in this as well, correct? From what, from a, that question you gave earlier. Am I making sense? No, no. We mean like the purpose of the UNA? No, it was also saying like um, um, the one when you were like, uh, what what is the purpose of the preamble? Yeah, to def um, to uh, recruit and defend against alien races. And so, yeah, so what, what um, that was that's kind of like included in this. What you think this part? Uh, yeah, I was trying to go back a little bit. Hold on, let me let me, let me look at the to see if they kind of lead us into this. Because that, that, that just threw me off with that. that. I was confused because I was thinking that, but I also knew that we had the, um, this part right here. And so I was kind of confused, but and like you said, that's what it kind of says too. So it's kind of like for recruiting, you know, and also to, def I guess I could say to the defend, to defend as well. Well, as I read it, um, I think the, the title says it best, Arguments for the Continuation, Perpetuation, and Support of the UNIA. Um, so whether it's uh, our own people that we're trying to encourage to support it, or if it's a, you know, an alien race, uh, a lot of this still plays into uh, why alien races should support uh, the UNIA as well. But just Arguments for the continuation, perpetuation, and support. I think I, I, I can't really say it any. I got you. Yeah, you're right. That. I got you. All right. Uh, so this is the UNI. These are things that we should know uh, and we should be able to kind of uh, spit off the top of our heads. Not all of them, but at least we should have, you know, two or three um, large into our memory. Um, if somebody asks, you know, what's the UNI done or what are they good for? The UNIA's work from 1917 to 1937. And also, yeah, this is only 1917, 1937. We should be building onto this list. You know, so 2022, uh, what are we doing in our communities to, to help our people? Um, what type of charitable work, um, political work, uh, activist work? But we can't just, you know, um, benefit off the representation of, reputation of our ancestors. You know, I don't like that. I really don't like when people say, you know, how great the UNIA was a hundred years ago, like that's 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 great, you know. But what are we doing right now? You know, what have we done in the past two or three years? Um, and we kind of just rest on what was done a hundred years ago, but we don't do anything today. So let me get off that. Uh, UNIA's work from 1917 to 1937. 
Number one, the UNIA has stirred the entire world of Negroes to a consciousness of race pride which never existed before. Number two, the UNIA broke down barriers of racial nationality among Negroes and caused, Af caused American, African, West Indian, Canadian, Australian, and South and Central American Negroes to realize that they have a common interest. Um, if you haven't got any questions or anything, just stop me um, as I'm going through it. Yes, sir. Um, I three. think um, Lady President is trying to come in. Brother Bruce, what was that? I think Lady President, um, um, she's trying to come in. Um, she sent the message real quick. I think the uh, password is locked. She should be able to, did y'all, y'all didn't have to put a password in, did you? You just came straight in? Yes, I came straight in. I think Brother Bruce had asked for a password, but then he jumped in. I didn't give him a password. She should be able to come straight in with the link. Didn't be a password. And everybody should be on the same requirement. If you could, Brother Bruce, um, try to help her with that, but I'm, I'm going to continue. Uh, and it is being recorded, so worst come to worst, we can give it a recording. Number three, the UNIA has given Negroes throughout the world a program of racial nationalism, which never existed before. And before the association calls all Negroes to recognize their common origin as Africans and their African descent. Number five, it has caused all other races to recognize the national aspirations of the Negro. It has placed the Negroes called before the League of Nations and the Versailles Peace Conference. Six, it placed the national aspirations of the Negro before the Disarmament Conference in Washington in 1924. Seven, the UNIA caused the French, English, and other European governments with colonies in Africa and the West Indies to extend greater privileges to the native race and offered them more secure positions in the respective civil service, diplomatic service, and political life of the country. Number eight, Negro justices, magistrates, and heads of government departments were appointed because of the activities of the UNIA in different countries. Number nine, the economic status of Negroes was raised in different countries because of the association. Number 10, the association taught the Negro how to go into big business. Mm. Number 11, it taught the Negro how to secure his own business enterprises through which tens of thousands of Negro businesses have been started all over the world. Number 12, it taught Negroes how to support their own professional men, doctors, lawyers, etc. That's a big one. I just went to a my dentist yesterday, uh, it's a black dentist place. Really like it, but if I would have never, you know, gotten into Garveyism, I would have never thought to even pursue, you know, you know, black owned businesses like this. 13, the UNIA taught the Negro how to support his own church. Number 14, they taught the Negro how to use his political power from which he has benefited in the United States, the West Indies, Africa and other countries. 15, the UNIA gave the Negro a national flag and a national hymn. 16, it caused the other races to spell the Negro, the word Negro with a capital N. So uh, prior to the UNIA, um, Negro was written with a lowercase n. What they called us, that's what they defined us as. 17, it taught Negro self-respect for their race. And actually uh, number 16, this is one of the um, declarations of rights. Uh, 54 declarations of rights was that the um, word Negro will be written with a capital N. 1718, it brought courage to the Negro race throughout the world. 19, it caused the Negro to search for a new type of leadership. That's what do it. 20, it taught the Negro preparedness against adversity. For the one, it has been most outstanding. It has been the most outstanding Negro organization in the world. 22 it is the most recognized international organization among Negroes. Mm. Mm. 23, it is known in all parts of the world. 24, it has taught the Negro to follow only Negro leadership. Yes, sir. 25, it has saved the Negro 
from the hypocritical, dishonest leadership of other people, which has never brought the Negro any good results. 26, it taught the Negro that the cats don't lead the rats, nor the lions, the sheep, nor the wolves, the foxes, and so Negroes should lead Negroes. 27, the UNI has taught the Negro to never rely upon the sweet sounding words and promises of others, but to reply on his words and his own promises if he is to be led safely. 28, it has taught the Negro to believe in himself and not to believe what, other, what another man seeks for himself. He has taught the Negro to believe in himself and not to believe that what another man seeks for himself, he is going to give away freely. 29, it taught the Negro to have his own labor organizations and not to expect other laborers who are competing with him for the same employment to give honest leadership for him to compete with them for the same job. Number 30 is the only organization that has given the Negro an international outlook. 31, it gave the Negro press a broader point of view. 32, it has kept the Negro from going red for the convenience of others. Now, 33, in 20 years, the UNIA changed the attitude of the Negro and set him on the way to a new hope. 34, one of the fundamental desires of the UNIA is to pro approach every Negro with an attitude of friendship, brotherhood, and sympathy. Therefore, every respective of the associate, every representative of the association must adopt an attitude that works to bring about the realization of such a desire. Yeah, we have to, as leaders, we have to um, have a spirit of charity. I mean, kind of, you know, think about it. Kindness. I had a whole lesson on winning mankind by kindness. Okay, it may be necessary. It may be necessary to use a great amount of tolerance to reach the desired end, but whenever, whatever is necessary must be done to bring about such a state of affairs. The policy is that you cannot drive a Negro away from the organization and still want to organize all Negroes. Every Negro that is lost prevents the ultimate achievement of the aims of the organization. So never try to drive a member out of the organization. Hold him and convert him. Always appreciate the fact that the majority of Negroes are ignorant. And you must exercise a great amount of tolerance to educate them to your point of view. This is your missionary work as other people who are willing to sacrifice their time and even their lives to Christianize our race. So we must exercise patience and time to civilize our people. I remember this from the, um, from the introduction. Um, when we were doing the, the four words. Garvey said, majority of Negroes are ignorant um, and we must be patient. <clears throat> we must be patient um, as we civilize them, we work to civilize them. Uh, 176, and then this jumps to 179. So I got to read 177 and 178 and not um, in there. 177, the attitude of expelling members and suspending members is not accepted with good grace. It should be resorted to only under the most extreme circumstances. The attitude should not be adopted to find an alternative. The attitude should be adopted to find an alternative to expulsion. The best way to prevent dissatisfaction in a division is to live up to the Constitution and bylaws, because it is only with the Constitution and bylaws that you can discipline a member. Um, that's going to be like a, a, a test question, but. Uh, I'll read it again. The best way to prevent dissatisfaction in this division is to live up to the Constitution and bylaws. That is, it is only with the Constitution and bylaws that you can discipline a member. So, somebody's doing something you don't like or behavior that you don't like, we can't just discipline them because we don't like them. Uh, there has to be justification um, uh, for punishment of their behavior uh, in the Constitution. And that's where this one has to come from. If a member violates the Constitution and bylaws, you can reasonably draw the violation to his or her attention. <clears throat> so, Constitution and bylaws. You cannot show partiality in a division of the association or in the work of the association. You must be impartial to maintain the principles of the association as the attraction for those who do not know anything about the association. <clears throat> Mm 
never ceasing your efforts to influence a Negro to join the association until he has joined. So long as he stays out of the UNIA, the work of United All Negroes cannot be accomplished. Always remember that you are a missionary for the cause of the association. You're a missionary for the cause of the association. So lose no opportunity that may present itself to make converts for the association. Um, let me stop real quick. But as we said, when we look at um, these lessons, you know, uh, in the beginning, we talk about self-development. Uh, in the middle, we were talking about understanding of society uh, and institutions and, and structures of government. Uh, last section um, is preparing us, in my opinion, to go out into the world. Um, and Garvey is, is <clears throat> uh, right where uh, he's asking us, I guess, is the best way to go out into the world with a spirit of uh, charity and kindness. Never ceasing your efforts to influence a Negro to join the association until he has joined. So long as he stays out of the UNIA, the work of uniting all Negroes cannot be accomplished. Always remember that you are a missionary for the cause of the association, so lose no opportunity that may present itself to make converts for the association. A splendid way of proselyting for the association is to, and I think that's like uh, doing missionary work, basically. A splendid way of um, promoting for the association is to interest all your friends and acquaintances in its movement. Whenever you go among them, tell them of anything done and accomplished by the association. <clears throat> Always find some work for the association. During the time you are not actually attending a meeting of the association or doing any special work for the association, devote your time in calling upon your acquaintances in the neighborhood, <clears throat> in your community, to talk to them into becoming members and supporters of the association. You should know all the people of your race on your street, in your neighborhood, and in your town. Um, this is um, a, a echo from lesson two on leadership that we should be known in our communities. My screen sharing pause. You should know all the people of your race in your street, your neighborhood, and your town. Approach them in your leisure hours, one by one to convert them to the organization, to get support from them for the organization. When you, when you come across responsible people of the race, take their names, profession, and address after talking to them about the association and send the same in a weekly report or monthly report to the president general's office at headquarters. Ask the president general to communicate with these persons in the manner that you think would best help to clinch support of these persons for the organization. In your own town, secure the names, addresses, and professions of all the responsible people, doctors, lawyers, merchants, preachers, etc. Send these names to the headquarters with comments about each person for headquarters to help influence these persons to support the organization. Always keep in touch with the newspapers published in your community. Get the newspaper published to print favorable news about the activities of the organization. Get the newspaper publishers to print favorable news. See to it that every intelligent person in the community of the race, in the community of the race, subscribes to or purchases the black man so that they may keep up with the activities of the movement. Read the black man regularly so that others will not have information you have not got. Mm -hmm. So the black man uh, was some type of publication. Um, I don't I need to look it up. And if somebody could, like, you know, while I'm doing this, that would that would help, but we'll find out what the black man publication was in relation to Marcus Garvey because I know we had I know we had the Negro world and I thought that was our publication um, but at this time Garvey's talking about a publication called the black man when you attend meetings of the unit when you attend meetings of the divisions as an official always carry yourself with dignity and always be impartial in dealing with the affairs of the division if you take sides not based on the constitution you are only destroying your own usefulness in that division and to the parent body. So again, uh, all of our authority uh, comes from the Constitution and any actions uh, should also be based on the Constitution. 
Your honor must always be uppermost in dealing with the matters affecting the division when you visit with them. If you are an official of the parent body, always see that the dignity of the parent body is maintained through you. Any bad behavior on your part will reflect upon the judgment of the parent body and appoint to you. So you don't just make yourself look bad, you make the parent body look bad. If you are a representative of the parent body with proper credentials, so um, a charter you know, is a form of credentials. Um, but uh, officers in the parent body, uh, like council general, um, assistant president generals, things like that. If you are a representative of the parent body with proper credentials, you must observe the agreement entered into between you and the parent body for dealing with the affairs of the association. Any violation of the agreement may cause you to lose your office as a representative of the parent body. Never overstep your authority in dealing with a division as a representative of the parent body. Never attempt to show your grand superiority to the displeasure of members of the division or officers of the division. Um, I like how Garvey used the word grand superiority. The lesson two on leadership, Garvey says that we must always be superior in, in some form, but he uses the words grand superiority and this, you know, I, I would, I would make a synonymous statement of arrogance. Uh, so never attempt to show your grand superiority to the displeasure of members of the division or officers of the division. Be as modest yet as firm as you can be in your dealings. Nothing invites antagonism more than an arrogant and unreasonable display of power. That's another test question. Uh, nothing invites antagonism more than what? Arrogant and unreasonable display of power. The most powerful people in the world are the most modest when dealing with those whose goodwill they depend on. They know how much immodesty offends others. Uh, never try to be offensive. Never threaten others, but reason with them. To threaten an officer or a member is to invite antagonism and belligerence, which will make your task more difficult. Never into in, never into never enter into any unworthy arrangement with officers or members of divisions because ultimately they will expose you when you do not do things to suit them. The moment you enter into any dishonorable arrangement, the person you have done so with holds it as a club over your head and will place you in a false position. In order not to expose yourself, don't do it. When working as a representative in the community, to get good results for the association, you should, you should divide that community into zones or districts. You may even reduce your districts to streets or blocks or streets and appoint some responsible, enthusiastic member in that zone, district, or street to be a kind of captain or lieutenant, lieutenant to keep the spirit of the people in the area regulated to the principles of the organization. The captain or lieutenant must be an active member of the division. Since he lives on the street, he would likely know all the people on the street and could help greatly in organizing them as members of the organization. Black Man, monthly magazine of Negro thought and opinion. Okay, so um, hold that, Brother Everett, because I'd like to know, you know, was that a UNIA publication or was that um, published by somebody else outside? But, um, all right. Let me finish this up and I'll get to that. Okay. You likely know all the people in the street. Your chief aim. So again, we got chief aim. You know, uh, well, lesson three, it said, you know, like our, our, our main aim. But in this lesson, we've got a different aim. Your chief aim must be to organize every man, woman, and child. Mm -hmm. If with all this material and possibilities, you cannot make the UNIA succeed in that community, you yourself are a colossal failure and not the people. Mm, hold on, let me read that again. That's, ooh, that that kind of hurt me. Uh, your chief aim must be to organize every man, woman, and child. If with all this material and possibilities, you cannot make the UNIA succeed in that community, you yourself are a colossal failure and not the people. Hmm. The greatest recognition of your merit and ability will be reflected by the number of people who are members of the association in your community, district, town, or state. Their activities will testify to your greater activity 
in their midst. This is a tough one. Um, so Garvey saying, if we can't recruit people to the UNIA, um, we are the failure and it's not the people's fault. Well, that kind of makes sense though. Because earlier he talks about most of our people being ignorant, you know, so it's not their fault. And we, we, that makes sense. And that just clicked, that just clicked in my head right there. You should not expect promotion from the parent body except you have done something to recommend you in your community for such promotion. Otherwise, your promotion will not be fair to someone else who has done his or her work. Don't complain, do the job, get results. The moment you start to complain, you are stating that the thing cannot be done. If you cannot do it at one place, you cannot do it at another. You are a failure who are no good. Garvey is going in. This is why people don't even want to, they ain't want to sit through this lesson. This is a tough lesson. Uh, so wait, all right, this ain't over. No, no, no. 180. Uh, you are a failure. You are no good. So this is on us. This is on the leaders. It ain't on nobody else. Our people are ignorant. They don't know no better. Um, so if we, if they don't organize, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Let your pride be in winning over an, an adversary. It gives good satisfaction. You have enough material in the UNIA to use as, a, as an argument against any man who is a member of the race, caring not how destructive he is. Therefore, don't leave him until you have converted him. Talk him out. In this respect, bring all of your diplomacy to bear. Use all the experience you have had in dealing with men and enlarge on and explain every good point of the UNIA. Carry your constitution and read the preamble and the aims and objects to him. Explain them as you have been taught them. And when he makes up his mind to join, get him right there. I need to read that again. I feel like this paragraph is, is almost a summary of this entire course. Um, because again, like I said, in the beginning we're developing ourselves. Um, and then we're learning about society. Um, and then, you know, we're learning to be missionaries uh, to organize for the, for the association. But let me read that again. He said, let your pride be in winning over an adversary. It gives good satisfaction. You have enough material in the UNIA to use as an argument against any man who is a member of the race, caring not how destructive he is. So, yeah. Therefore, don't leave him until you have converted him. Talk him out. In this respect, bring all of your diplomacy to bear. Use all the experience you have had in dealing with men and enlarge on and explain every good point of the UNIA. Carry your constitution and read the preamble and the aims and objects to him. Explain them as you have been taught them and when he makes up his mind to join, get him right there. This is what we're here for. Um, it's to convert our people into um, helping ourselves. Um, it's not something that's natural for us. It's not something that we're taught. So um, that's our job is, is to, bring, to bring that out of people, you know, this collective, the collective spirit. If you have approached him to become a member, let him let him join then. If you have approached him for support, give him or write, get him to write or give his support right there. Afterwards, immediately thank him by correspondence for joining or supporting. To give him an impression of your business like ability. The best time to call on people is immediately after meals, not before, because when people are hungry, they are not in a good mood. Call immediately after the breakfast hour, the dinner hour, and the supper hour. If you're calling at the office, never call an hour before lunch or an hour before dinner. Always go smiling, pleasant. Always go smiling and pleasant. Don't carry a long face. If you have been abruptly received and abruptly talked to, reply with pleasant remarks and smile your subject into changing his or her mood. Even a savage will admit defeat when met with by a smile. If a person has a frown on his face, say, I hope you are well, Mr. Jones. That will put him off guard immediately. If he states that he is not well, sympathize with him and tell him about some remedy you know. 
This is good psychology to win your subject. Or you may say, you have a very pretty picture here, Mr. Jones, or some other thing, though not pretty to flatter his vanity, but to, though not pretty to flatter his vanity, but to take him out of his sullen mood. If he is a smoker, offer him a cigarette. Tell him something that you think he ought to be interested in. <clears throat> you may hit, you may hit upon something by looking at things around him. Have you seen the latest picture? Have you heard the latest news? Then go into your subject after you have changed his attitude. Don't start talking to a sullen man on the subject you are approaching him on until you have worn him over to a pleasant mood. It would be better to go back and visit him a second time. So make sure people are in a good mood before we start trying to uh, recruit and convert. Always point out to him that you and I act as trustee for the race. Help him to understand that every Negro benefits from the success of the organization. In arguing for the support of the UNIA, draw extensively upon your imagination and find an argument to support you. You have an argument of success of a nation, the success of other race groups, and always use the Jew as argument. I'm glad he brought that up, because that's kind of where we are right now. And that's, uh, Garvey uses a lot of uh, comparison to the Jews, but uh, before Israel was a geographical land boundary, it was a group of people. Um, it was actually just one man uh, who had a family and that family became a group of people. But before Israel was where it is now, uh, they were quote unquote captive uh, in the land of Egypt, you know, so that's kind of where we are right now as the UNIA. Uh, we are a group of people, a family, a race um, that's uh, in somebody else's land. Um, but we can still organize, come together. And uh, when it's time to move out and get our own, we'll be prepared to do that. But Garvey was trying to do that. And that's why he talked a lot. Well, I'm not gonna say that's why he talked a lot, but you'll hear a lot about uh, the comparison of Jews in his teachings. Um, amongst the first person to be approached for help for the UNIA are professionals and businessmen and businessmen and women of the race. A better organized race would mean better business for them. Tell them that tell them that that is the work of the UNIA. Therefore, they should support it. Let them realize the power you have in your hand to direct patronage one way or the other as an organization. So when over your new prospect, tell him that Mr. So-and-so has done so-and-so for the organization, but it must be a fact, not a lie. Then he will not want to be left out and will support you. This must be done for, this must not be done for personal benefit, because if you are found using this method for personal gain, you will be struck off the roll of students and be disqualified as a representative. Because the moment the person finds out you have used the approach for personal purposes, you have damaged the association and your reputation. Hence, you are of no use, either to the association or to anybody else. Um, very important point. Um, these lessons are not intended for personal profit. This is for the organization. This is for uh, the collective. And um, I think Garvey's trying to say, like, our people, though they may be ignorant, they're smart enough to to see through that and you, you set yourself up for failure. The first international convention of UNIA held in New York from the 1st to the 31st of August, 1920, formulated and adopted the Declaration of Rights of Negro Peoples of the World to which the organization is committed until the objects of the said declaration are fully realized. Declaration must be studied by each leader of the race. So that's, that's another one of the documents, the Declaration of Rights of Negro Peoples of the World. Uh, in order to know the UNIA and teach the UNIA. The declaration must be studied by each leader of the race. It is to be found on page 135 in the second volume of the Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. So going back, like I said, I, th I thought Philosophy and Opinions was one of those texts and um, he, he's, he's making that clear here. In seeking financial aid for the UNIA, always do so with confidence. 
The high and lofty aims of the organization and the universal objects to be achieved can only be done through the support of each and every member of the race. This calls for the support of every man. To gain such support, always impress upon the Negro that heretofore he has supported white organizations such as the churches and he has contributed to their institutions without gaining any direct benefit. He has even supported the Salvation Army. Therefore, there is no reason why he should not support a movement of his own that calculates to bestow upon him and his generation un untold benefits. Are we saying a lot right there? Like, our people do so much you know, for other races, but we don't really do much uh, for ourselves. And that's, that's frustrating. Contributions to the UNIA should be generally accepted from Negroes, but where other people of other races can be approached and are willing to give help, such help may be accepted, but without any strings attached or promises made that would in any way compromise the clear cut intelligence of the policy of the UNIA. Such contributions do not entitle the donors to any privileges of membership or any right to attend the meetings of the UNIA except public meetings as guests. The contributions should never entitle them to attend or take part in any of the business meetings of the organization. Their donations may be accepted in the same way as Negroes. Their donations may be accepted in the same way as Negroes give to white organizations without having any claim in those organizations. Man, that's crazy. Like we, just, yeah, we just give our money. We don't have no type of say in what's going on, but we, we quick to donate to other, other groups. Whenever donations are accepted from other races, their names of such persons when registered on the same account of donations as that of Negroes must be marked with a cross. And when such donations are being forwarded to the parent body, an explanation must be given stating that such a person is a member of the white race or whatever race the person may be, so that no communication of a private nature will be sent to that person, which reveals the business of the NIA. This is very important because, not, because by not distinguishing between the donors, such persons may be written to as if they are members of the NIA. They must be sent communication that they have they must be sent communications that they have no right to receive. They may be sent communications that they have no right to receive. So um, we can receive assistance from other races, but um, that assistance is marked with an asterisk, uh, and these individuals are not, you know, entitled to any privileges based on that contribution. And this is specifically people of the alien race. In approaching people of the other race for help, your argument must be different from that of an approach to members of your race. Your appeal should be based on humanity, good citizenship, or helping a worthy cause. Never explain the objects that are of uppermost importance to the UNIA, because they will naturally re react with unfriendliness and suspicion. Never believe that another race is so friendly as to know your objects and not try to hinder you ultimately hinder you and ultimately succeed. Whenever you make an appeal to an individual or individuals for financial help for the organization and you have failed in getting a response, the failure is not due to the person or persons you have addressed yourself to, but may be due to your inability to properly interpret to them the objects and aims of the UNIA and the reasons why they should support the association. Always be in a position to interpret those aims and objects to support, to gain support, because people are always willing to respond to a thing that is to benefit them, even in a remote way. Never approach anyone for help for the, the association with doubt in your mind. It is better that you wait until you are in a in the frame of mind to talk conscientiously so as to carry conviction rather than try to do so when your spirit is low. Let every day, every hour, and every minute count in your life for something done, something accomplished. Don't waste time, it is a sin. Time wasted can never be recalled or regained. Try to always be the best advocate of the cause of the UNIA. Try to let no one surpass you in doing that. There is something in you that is individual that nobody else has. 
try to bring it out and let that be your individuality and personality, which people will remember you and talk about you. There is nothing that someone else has done in the triumph of a cause that you cannot do if you go about it in the right way. Always try to find the right way. Never hang around people who are always discouraged, despondent, probably stricken, poor, and never do well. So again, Garvey earlier talked about us being around certain people and not being around certain people. He repeated that here. Always trying to find the right way. Never hang around people who are always discouraged, despondent, probably stricken, poor, and never do well. You ultimately become like them. Try to get around cheery people, happy people, prosperous people, and you will unconsciously take on their prosperity and their happiness. Never live in a house with or keep company with people who always have bad luck stories. Their sins will come upon you, for the same evil spirit that is following them will also be near you. Always appear bright when you're seeking help for the UNIA. Uh, it is 9.31. I'm on page 186. In order to complete the reading, I got to get to page uh, 204. Um, so I'm going to keep reading. If you can't say, I understand. A um, couple more pages on history of UNIA, and then we'll go into the five year plan. Last lesson on uh, history of UNIA, or last section on history of UNIA, is titled Dealing with Division. In dealing with a division of UNIA, always recognize the division itself as a chartered body as the representative. Re recognize the division itself as a chartered body, as the representative body. The units of a division, according to the Constitution, are all subordinate to the division. The divisional officers are the only responsible officers in a division. No auxiliary has the status of the division. In dealing with a division, first recognize the officers of the division according to the Constitution. The legions, the Black Cross nurses, the mortal corps, and all other auxiliaries must be obedient to the officers of the division. So, okay, so the auxiliaries of the legion, Black Cross nurses, mortal corps, any other um, type of uh, structures you have in your division. Great care must be taken in watching and controlling the activities of the legions because in ignorance, they are apt to get the divisional organization in trouble by trying to exercise authority while they are only members of an organization registered by the state. Mm. That's, that's true. That's why we haven't really had our division, our legion active um, because the people that kind of want to do legion, you know, that's all they want to do is guns and stuff. They don't really want to study politics and, and do charity work. So they kind of, you got to be careful with those individuals and make sure you got the right leadership all of the shots. The Legion's function is more physical, cultural, and disciplinary than anything else. Any hostile demonstration by them that endangers the community or the peace thereof or creates trouble among the members must be quickly put down and if necessary, their units suspended to prevent such trouble. The legions have no control of the Black Cross nurses. The Black Cross nurses are a separate unit. The only relationship may be that someone from the legion with the ability to train may give them physical exercise and proper discipline. The Black Cross nurses fall entirely under the supervision of their own head nurse, who is to seek for them first aid training from some medical institutions or individuals through the officers of the division. The motor corps is also an independent body of women who may be trained by a competent legion officer, but with no direct affiliation. See to it that divisional officers do not allow members of the legions to appoint themselves to any office as lieutenant captains, majors, colonels, or whatnot without the authority of the president, who is the ranking officer of the legions in his division, as set down in the Constitution. See to it that Divisions do not allow Tom, Dick, and Harry to get into the division to speak to and lecture to them without the authority of the parent body, and that they do not allow anybody who anybody to use the meetings of UNIA to put over their own propaganda, which tends to distract members from the UNIA. Hmm. Let me read that again. 
Uh, see to it that divisions do not allow Tom, Dick, and Harry to go into the division to speak to lecture to speak to and lecture to them without the authority of the parent body, and that they do not allow anybody to use the means of UNIA to put over their own propaganda, which tends to distract members from the UNIA. And we have to make sure, as officers, uh, we have to make sure that our members and our individuals are focused. Um, and we have to you know, keep, uh, keep the distractions low. See to it that no fake lecturer or wildcat team representative get into any meeting of the UNIA through any individual influence. Keep a close eye on African princes, chiefs, princesses, and all such fake personalities who come into the meetings of the UNIA. No prince, chief, or princess adopts such methods of going around begging and exploiting. Princes and princesses are royal personalities who stay at home or only make state visits to other countries and are generally accommodated by the head of a nation. Anytime such fake princes or chiefs come among you, expose them and drive them out. Never entertain anyone who claims to be Christ, God, John the Baptist, or such presumptive titles. Never allow divisions to take the word of persons claiming to represent Mr. Garvey or claiming to be sent by Mr. Garvey. Let them produce the letter. If they can't, drive them away. Whenever you find such fakers, hand them over to the police and make an example of them. Have it announced in the newspaper to scare others. Whenever anyone is called upon to sit in a UNI meeting and speak in your presence and say things not in keeping with the policy or membership training of the association, after they have finished, you should rise immediately and correct them for the good of the membership. Instruct all presidents and presiding officers to do the same. So as officers, and especially as presidents, um, we got to clear things up. So if somebody is in our meeting and they say some something that's out of line, um, we have to come behind that and, and you know uh, make things clear for for the audience and the other members. <laughs> Whenever you think something is detrimental to the organization and its policies, never fail to correct it immediately so that the people may not get the wrong impression. Always defend the organization and protect its name in the public press or otherwise. If you find an opportunity to debate with other people to maintain the principles of the organization, do so by challenging them. Before you debate, always read up on the point of view or subject so as to be able to handle the same in keeping with the principles and objects of the UNIA. Whenever you are in doubt about anything in, your, in the UNIA, write to headquarters. Never take it upon yourself to settle the question decisively if you are in doubt. Always say, uh, quote, pending the ruling of my superior officers, this is my opinion, end quote, and leave it at that. Do this only when you are in doubt. <clears throat> encourage the divisions to use only programs at regular, encourage the divisions to use only programs at regular and public meetings that express the sentiments of Negroes. For instance, all recitations should be all recitations should be by Negro poets and authors. Songs, hymns, and choruses should be by Negro composers also. Encourage the juveniles to study. Negro poem, encourage, encourage juveniles to study Negro poems and songs. Encourage local divisions to have a reader who is educated to read striking articles from the black man each week. Encourage some bright juvenile in each division to study in the site the quote tragedy of white injustice, end quote. So, never have them recite this poem while white people are present. Encourage some bright boy or girl to study and recite uh, African fundamentalism. Always keep these two major bits of literature before the people until they come to know them almost by heart. Now that completes lesson 21, and um, I'm gonna go straight into Lesson 22, I'll try to get this done in 20 minutes or less. So lesson 21, um, that's like a summary of the history of UNIA and it's like our overall directive uh, as we go out into the community, um, basically what we should be saying, the energy we should have, the spirit we should have, um, so, and, and the motivations behind that. 
So, yeah, with Lesson 21 and all the lessons previous, you know, we should be very effective uh, at organizing. You and I mean. Last lesson, uh, Lesson 22. And uh, I believe in the orientation, this lesson was skipped over for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but the, the title of this lesson is Five Year Plan. And this book was written, published in like 86, I think. So if we really took this serious, we could have done, you know, five, one, two, three. We could have done this five times, you know, by now. Um, and this is part of the reason why I was trying to have this training specifically for Division 421, um, even though Division 421 ain't really, you know, not really here right now. But we have been talking a lot about fundraising and raising funds and trying to do things. So, um, and everybody's got ideas on how we can do things and what we should be doing. Um, but for me, um, as a member of the UNIA, I felt the best one that's ever done is this Garvey. You know, and that's why we're here. But it's like people come to the organization to try to outshine Garvey. Um, and that's fine, you know, do your thing. But in another previous lesson, Garvey talked about don't try to impress somebody with your ability or your ideas until you show them that you've been successful with it. Um, and that's a lot of what I hear uh, today when people are talking about ideas or how to do this, how to do that. But we're not showing that success in our personal lives. So uh, for me, you know, when it comes to plans, future plans, things like that, how to raise funds, um, I go to the source. I go to, you know, the most successful man uh, in the 20th century, um, even though we're in 21st century now, but you know, um, I look at Garvey's words. So I think we can do it. I think we can update this five-year plan, uh, make it modern, but um, I think this would be a good place to start any group that's you know serious about the end goal you know because we we have goals and we have aims but what's the timeline on it you know we've been talking about some of the same we've been talking about this stuff for 100 years um so i work in a profession i'm an engineer and we we do things based on schedule you know it usually takes us about 18 months to to get something in but you have to have a starting point, a day when you start, and you have to have an expect, expected, not end, but over a certain amount of time, you should expect a certain result. Um, and we've been, you know, in the organization just year after year after year with no real tangible qualitative goals other than, you know, more members and more money. Um, but when you ask how to do it, you know, it's the only answer you get is, recruit your friends and family, you know. Um, so let me get off that. Lesson 22, <clears throat> final lesson of message to the people. And this lesson is the five-year plan of the UNIA. In 1934, at the International Convention of UNIA held at Edelweiss Park Crossroads, St. Andrews, uh, Jamaica, the President General of the Association presented to the convention in session, the five-year plan scheme as the most possible and practical scheme through which the association could rehabilitate itself and carry out the major objects of the organization. <clears throat> so this is 1934. Uh, the greatness of the organization was seen in the 20s. Do we know when Marcus Garvey was deported from uh, the United States? Anybody? I don't even know the answer to this. All right. Um, he was deported. I think it was 20. 19. Wait, the class started in 1937. Dang, I'm yeah. going to guess 1930. Is it 37 to 36, something like that? No, he was deported from the United States earlier than that. I don't know that. Uh, I want to say it's 25. Let me check. Is it 25 or 27? He may have went to jail in 25 and then he got deported in 27. Nineteen twenty-seven, yeah. So he went to jail okay. in 25 and he got deported 
in 27. But um, so, you know, we, we, we all know, um, the, the, well, we should all, we should all know the story, you know, of Garvey and 1920, well, 1914, um, creating, establishing the UNIA, um, what was it, 19, I don't know, I don't know when he came to the United States, I can't think of that, but, uh, 1920, he, uh, you know, that was the first international convention. So from that time, over the next five years was probably the, the, the highlight of the UNIA. Um, and then Marcus Garvey was charged uh, in 1925, was sent to jail in 1925. Um, and then by 1927, uh, he was deported. So really Garvey only had five years, you know, uh, to carry out his function as a um, you know, provisional president uh, of Africa and the, the leader of um, the government that he established in 1920. But the reason why I'm saying that, because in the beginning, it starts out, it says in 1934. So this five-year plan was developed in 1934, uh, seven years after the deportation of Garvey, nine years after the incarceration of Garvey. Uh, so you know, this is Garvey's life. Uh, he, he lived through it. He saw the greatness. He saw the, the high moments. He saw the deportation. This is years after that. And now he's had time to reflect. Uh, and this is the plan that he developed, you know, based on uh, that reflection. I just wanted to state that. The scheme was thoroughly discussed and adopted by resolutions, properly moved and seconded and carried unanimous, unanimously as set out in the reprint circular from the Black Man magazine, August, September, 1935, herewith incorporated. So the reason why, you know, I'm gonna say this again really quick and I'm gonna just finish the lesson, but you gotta, we gotta think. Um, and Garvey says that we should be visionaries. <clears throat> as leaders, we should be visionaries. But what is our plan, you know, from a UNIA, from a, uh, a parent body level, what is our plan for the next so many years? And locally, what is our plan for the next so many years? Um, and I'll tell you, like, you know, me, I really, I didn't have anything. You know, I don't have a, a finite, detailed plan, but, you know, um, Garvey gave us something. So why not start where Garvey left off? You know, and it, it's, it's like we trust Garvey with everything else. You know, we love the flag, we love the anthem. Um, the UNIA, the aims and objectives, the 54 Declaration of Rights, we love all that stuff. But then when it comes to his last plan, his five-year plan, that's when we're like, oh, I don't really know, man. I don't really want to mess with that. So I'm a comprehensive Garveyite. You know what I mean? I'm not a pick and choose. I like this. I don't like that. Um, I try to take it, take take the whole thing, you know, pause. Um, <laughs> but I try to... Um, Received Garvey's message as a whole and not as pieces uh, that I agree with and disagree with. <clears throat> All right. Explanation of the five year plan. The five year plan is a scheme of colossal magnitude. Should the amount budgeted for be fully subscribed, it would enable the organization to, in a most practical and efficient manner, carry out not only the industrial, commercial, and other phases of the convention program but to a great extent encourage and carry out many of the major objects for racial development. Um, so this plan is specifically developed to address uh, the most practical and efficient manner to carry out our aims and objectives. If we don't have a substitute for a most efficient and effective way uh, to carry out our aims and objectives, then I would have to say, by default, this is our primary source. Uh, the idea is to get every Negro in the world to pledge to contribute voluntarily a sum of money for five years and pay the same within five years to the plan. The amount to be contributed is to be left entirely to the financial ability of the individual person. It was suggested that no person should be so poor as to not be able to contribute at least $5 within five years. Um, so this $5 in the 30s, um, add inflation to that, it's probably like $15 billion. 
uh, to such a fund to assist in the general development of the race. Hence, nobody should be left out. So every single one of our people throughout the world is responsible for a minimum $5 contribution over the next five years. That seems very reasonable to me. Um, Hence, nobody should be left out. The majority of people will be in a better position. The majority of people will be in a better position to contribute larger sums within the five years. For instance, some may be able to contribute 10, 20, 100, 500, or 1,000. So the bare minimum was five, um, and those that were more affluent, more successful, um, obviously, you know, what, what's, what's the, to whom much is given, much is expected. I think that's the biblical quote. And then the marble one is, um, Great power requires responsibility, something like that. But um, basically, those who have more and can do more would be expected uh, to do more than $5. Uh, there is every reason why every Negro should contribute to this fund voluntarily. So we we'll supply the organization with the financial resources to work without prejudice in the complete interest of the race. It would help the organization realize all of its objects from which every each and every Negro would benefit. The method of contributing the fund is as follows. A person desirous of contributing makes a voluntary pledge for the amount to be contributed within five years to be paid in installments, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually until paid. If possible, one could pay his pledge in one payment. The pledge must be sent to the headquarters of the organization, the parent body, 2200 East 40th Street, Cleveland, Ohio. The person pledging must give his or her full name, correct address, and profession. The person may send the first installment with the pledge. Or receive the first installment, a pledge card will be issued from headquarters to the subscriber or donor with the amount pledged written on the card and the amount of the installment paid also entered. The card is returned to the donor with a request that whenever other installments are to be paid, that the card will be forwarded with the installment for the amount to be entered on the card and the in the ledger at headquarters and returned to the donor. After the pledge is fully paid, a certificate is issued by the parent body to show the particular person paid the pledge and contributing to the five-year plan of the organization. At the close of the five-year period, a record will be published in which each donor who has paid up the pledge will have his or her name recorded for the information of all concerned. The amount of money collected in the plan will be appropriated for carrying out the many schemes authorized by the convention in 1934 and set out in the circular referred to above. In explaining the five-year plan, great stress must be laid out on the fact that the Negro to in the fact that the Negro in the fact on the fact that for the Negro to realize the objective of a nation and government of his own he must first have financial security. While no individual person can create a nation or a government for the race because each individual is looking after his own personal and private business, therefore, there must be an organized cooperative effort towards this end. Hence, the effort is represented by the UNIA to which all Negroes must contribute and with which they must cooperate. Established nations and governments get their revenue from taxes levied on the citizens. The Negro having no government cannot raise revenue for the purpose in that way. Hence, those who desire such a thing must be voluntary contributors. That's powerful. Um, so it, we got a very tough task of explaining to our people the benefits of government, uh, self-governance, um, and then trying to get them to commit to that um, financially for their benefit as well as the uh, greater benefit of the race. The establishment of the different enterprises, which will help to find employment for Negroes and the profit of which will help to go, will go to help the organization to carry out its nationalistic program, is in keeping with the principles of the organization to hold all its properties and wealth in hereditary trust for the Negro race. A contribution to the fund simply means that one is helping to place the race through organization in a position of financial security through which it can march on to the realization of nationhood and government. If everyone contributed just the amount of money that is thrown away on non-essentials in five years, it would turn out that the very amount that would have been lost in waste 
comes the actual resource to establish that which is most needed by every Negro in the world. Therefore, it is a patriotic duty of every Negro to contribute to the fund to make the plan a success. The many enterprises we undertake in America, Canada, and West Indies, South and Central America, and Africa will be instrumental in finding employment for countless thousands of Negroes who never have been out, who never, who would never have been employed otherwise. If the, if the plan is fully supported, the very magnitude of the plan would give it status that would compel respect for our aims and objects by all races. The five-year plan has been as the most, the five-year plan has been seen as the most thoughtful economic scheme that could be undertaken as a solution to the economic, industrial, political, and other problems of the Negro race. Let me say that again. So until we develop a plan that's better than this plan, this is our, this, in my mind, this should be our default plan. This should be communicated from the top to the bottom um, as far as what we should be doing. But Garvey said, again, the five-year plan has been seen as the most thoughtful, most thoughtful economic scheme that could be undertaken as a solution to the economic, industrial, and political, political and other problems of the Negro race. If we don't have another answer to uh, the economic, industrial, and political problems of our race, uh, we should be working on the solution that Garvey gave us. No Negro should be left out of an interview on the subject without fully convincing him that he should contribute to and have him contribute to such a plan. Uh, section, how to get results. There is no use trying to represent the UNIA before making up your mind to get good results. The most important results are financial, active, and moral support. Financial support means to get as much money as possible to help finance the program. In getting such money, you must do so at the least cost so that the amount received will produce a net that can be used for the purpose for which it was obtained. Active results means enrolling persons as active members of the association. People who will always work as members to help put the program over. Moral support means to secure sympathy and cooperation from individuals so that the organization can always count on such persons to do their best for the movement. So the results that we're looking for are financial, active, and moral. Our next section, the way to get money. Crazy. We talk about all these economic issues. Um, I'm gonna just leave it there. But we talk about all these economic issues, and Garvey has a. Uh, it's how many pages it is? Oh my God! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He got eight and a half, nine pages um, on the subject of the way to get money. Um, so if we're not, you know, if we're not looking at this and we're not reading this, we're not teaching this, are we really serious about, you know, raising funds? That's, that's my question. So Garvey, okay, the way to get money. Garvey says there are many ways to get money for the UNIA. Number one, approach and interview the most substantial members of your race in your community or your jurisdiction, such as the ministers of the gospel, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and substantial tradesmen, and persons of important occupation. Meet them at their homes or at their offices or place of businesses and seriously talk to them about the program of the organization. Explain to them all its details, aims, and objects, and after doing so, ask them to contribute to the assistance of the association. Whatever they contribute must always be recorded with their names, occupations, and addresses. The names of such persons must always be transmitted to the parent body for record, and all remarks that may be necessary to explain the character and disposition of the person must be added to the report on each person so the parent body can be advised as to the nature of the person to help the cause. This is important also because communication with the people must be couched in language consistent with the person's disposition and intentions. 
It must be taken for granted that people of this class will be skeptical at first and have to be convinced by proper arguments. If you can win over the support of such people who are the natural representative class of the race in the community, you have achieved a great deal in winning the kind of support that will enable the organization to speak with authority because it is the best class of people supporting you. Number two, in approaching ministers of the gospel, always be diplomatic enough to convince them of the Christian policy of the organization and the willingness of the organization to support the cause of the Christian religion. If the preacher is won over and contribute, you may get further assistance from him by seeking permission to speak to his congregation to raise funds for the organization. In doing so, always arrange with him that a percentage of what is raised is given to the church so that he may feel interested and satisfied to assist that way. No preacher should be left until he has consented to help in some way, because there is no greater way of the church showing its willingness to expand the functions of the church than by helping a cause like the UNIA. If a preacher refuses, it is evident that he has not been in touch with the proper argument or that he is positively selfish. I'm glad he put that in there, because sometimes people are just selfish. No matter how much information you give them, um, they're going to be stubborn. And I mean, maybe we can, it's always a different way of how you say things. But... Oh, man. One of the arguments to be used with the preachers is that by preaching unity is the association is assisting the church by getting Negroes to support their own religion, just as they are encouraged to support everything else that is theirs. Number three, in approaching a doctor, you should point out that the association preaching unity, self-support, and self-reliance you are helping to increase his practice in the community. The same argument should be used for Negro lawyers and Negro businessmen. The argument for those who are in good positions employed as they may be by white people is that white people will not always employ Negroes. They will only do so until they have been approached or forced to substitute white employees for Negroes. You must convince these Negroes that the association is seeking to establish such economic and industrial independence for the race as to be able to find substantial employment for its own men and women of quality and ability as evidenced by the program of the five-year plan. Tell them that with the success, with the success, their support will help bring about uh, this can be achieved. Number five, a general approach should be made to all other Negroes in their homes or any other place that you may conveniently meet them. Get them to contribute individually by using good sound arguments for their support. The argument for the common people is that there is no economic security for the race when it is always dependent on the white man's employment. Therefore, by supporting the UNIA to the point of success, opportunities of employment will be created by the establishment of factories, mills, commercial farming, and shipping enterprises, which may offer them employment according to their training. You, need, you can explain to all of them, professionals and common people alike, that contributing to the funds of UNIA is no different to contributing to the funds of the white organizations which so many of them have done for so many centuries. But the point is that while contributing to white organizations, they are supplying the club to break their own heads, economically and politically. In contributing to the UNIA, they will be supplying the ammunition that we use to fight their enemies and to establish their own security. Explain to them that there is as much need for self-denial, even to the poorest person of the race to help the UNIA, as the self-denial to help other causes, which they are not directly, with which they are not directly identified. There should be proper method of approach in acquiring funds for the organization. If you are a representative of the organization, you will be supplied with the necessary credentials and the necessary account forms to submit for the gathering of such support. No one is supposed to make an appeal for the UNIA who is not authorized to do so because it would mean trouble and fraud would be unworthy. Trouble and fraud and would be unworthy of anyone who has secured these lessons. Mm. Well, let me go back and read that one again. Because he's talking about securing these lessons. No one is supposed to make an appeal for the UNIA who is not authorized to do so, because it will mean trouble and fraud and would, possibly, and would be unworthy of anyone who has secured these lessons. Um, 
So part of us getting these lessons is a level of accountability, you know, um, say ignorance is bliss, you know, and not knowing you just, just out there and just, you know, can't really be uh, uh, held accountable because you don't know, but we don't have that luxury anymore. We do know, and we do know that we will be held accountable. This method of approach must not be used for personal purposes, but only for the purposes of the UNIA. Number seven, one of the major ways of raising funds for the UNIA is by public meetings advertised for the UNIA to explain its objects to speak on its general program. Such meetings may be arranged through the agency of divisions of the association or an affiliated one or through agents in the community. Where there is no branch of the association, these meetings can be arranged through friendly churches. In organizing Excuse such me, meetings, sorry. an agent can be appointed. Can I say something? Yes, sir. Um, can, I, I, I wanted to, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. Um, I believe you mentioned about 10 minutes ago about shipping agencies. Um, it says something shipping and, um, and farming. Now, uh, I, I, I wanted to say something about that. Um, did he, he was saying that we should start shipping agencies and um, farming agencies. Is that what he, what he was saying to um, produce money? Yes, um, I'll read it again. Um, okay. So Thanks, this was sir. the argument. This was the argument for the common, the common people uh, in order to encourage common people to support our five year plan. The argument for the common people is that there is no economic security for the race when it has when it has to always depend on the white man's employment. Therefore, by supporting the UNIA to the point of success, opportunities for employment will be created by the establishment of factories, mills, commercial, farming, and shipping enterprises, et cetera, which may offer them employment according to their training. So for our common men and women, um, blue collar workers, you know, uh, our message to them to support the five year plan is that, um, you know, there may not always be, uh, white man may not always hire you, you know, so unless we create our own industries of farming and, and shipping, we'll always be, you know, it's up to their decision. You know, we, we won't ever have our own our destiny in our own hands. That's our, that's okay. exactly the direction I think that we should go in. Um, as far as that industries, those those are key industries right there that are um, relevant today. So um, definitely. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, industry at any type of industry. Um, it could be um, um, a clothing a clothing line or something like that, a UNIA clothing line. It can be um, um, any type of, like, we already got a farm. You know, the UNIA already has a farm, Liberty Farms. So now um, yeah. the other two is, um, uh, the other one is shipping. And also that includes um, rail and trucking and stuff like that. Because shipping, nothing gets to the ship unless it comes on a truck. So... Uh, right. Part of that five-year plan, we should. I, I just personally believe that we should focus in that direction because um, um, that's the, the industries that are relevant in the um 21st century and where we are are right now in 2022, especially with the um the um shipping. So I, I'm with it definitely. So um, thank you, brother Bruce. Uh, yeah. Um, just a couple more pages, uh, and we'll be finished. Number seven, one of the major ways of raising funds for the UNIA is by public meetings advertised for the UNIA. I already read this. Yeah, I did. In organizing such meetings, an agent should be appointed first. A place secured and proper advertisement prepared and distributed in the community before the date of the meeting. In a community of 2,000 people, at least 1,000 handbills should be printed. Goodness gracious. In a community of 10,000 or more people, 2,000 or 3,000 handbills should be printed and widely distributed among the Negro population. All agents should be written to and asked to see that this is carried out so that upon going to the place, 
going to the place to address the meeting, you will not go where no one knows about it. Always word your handbills in the most attractive manner so as to create general interest among Negroes. Um, obviously, we can update this. Um, I still agree with the hand to hand, uh, but we can use social media as well. Uh, I'm not necessarily don't know the numbers and things like that, but we can use social media as a promotion tool for events as well. You should mention that you are a graduate. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this. You should mention that you are a graduate of the School of African Philosophy to suggest that to suggest to the people that you have rare, uncommon knowledge of great importance. This will attract their curiosity. When speaking at such meetings, you should be at your best on the subject that you are going to discuss. After you have made your speech, sit down for a couple of minutes, then rise again and make your financial appeal. Hmm. I had this thing down. Unless you are addressing a division, don't make an appeal for money in your speech that you make, because people will think that you are only speaking for money. Immediately after the speech, get up and make another short speech for fun to support the organization. Did this recently, but I didn't do it on purpose. Just by accident. Always have your meeting well organized inside by. Always have your meeting well organized inside by arranging for ushers to take up the collection after you have asked for special contribution, which should be brought up to the table immediately in front of the platform. After you have made the appeal for special contributions of large amounts, then get the ushers to take up small amounts. Never ask for extraordinary amounts of special contributions. Consider the pockets of the people. You may ask for five, three, two, one dollars from those who can give that much for such a cause. Then after you have exhausted that, you may even ask for a special contribution of 50 cent. And then take up the collection from those who may not be able to give more than 25 cents or 10 cents. Um, obviously keep in mind inflation. Um, so I think like, you know, in the beginning, probably like maybe up to fifty dollars, you know, twenty dollars, ten dollars, five dollars, um, and then towards the end, one dollar um, any change that you have. When you go into a strange community where the people are not members of the UNIA, make your first public meeting a meeting for obtaining members. All members who are to join must pay one dollar and thirty five cents of which is the dues for the first month. Um, it's actually three dollars. Uh, 25 cents is joining fee. It's a $10 joining fee and $10 for 25 cents for the Constitution, 15 cents for the Britain certificate. Um, but we still have the same process, and all divisions should have buttons and certificates for members. Um, but that those expenses are part of their joining fee, which is uh, $10 currently, and then $3 a month. Each person must be given a receipt for the one dollar and the person's name, occupation, address, and age is registered in the book. You have secured seven or more people as members. You have enough to start a division. After the meeting, call upon those who have joined to appoint a president and then have them elected vice president and treasurer and secretary. Leave the constitution and tell them that they must control the organization in keeping with the constitution. Tell them they will be privileged to hold regular meetings to suggest twice a week, but particularly on Sunday at 3 p.m. or at 8 p.m. Instruct them to work to secure more members and then they can apply to the parent body for a charter. The cost of which is $25. And that cost has changed. Also tell them that they are privileged to collect money in the community from others who are sympathetic to the association to secure money for the charter. And that's a big part of what the charter um, authorizes. It authorizes us to raise funds and, and collect funds in our jurisdiction. You should keep in constant touch with the secretary you have elected and find out when they are ready to apply for their charter. Then recommend that they contact the parent body for the charter. When they receive their charter, they should be advised to have a special meeting for the dedication of the charter. Then invite all the Negroes of the community to attend, at which time they should try to get more members for the association. If you remain in town for second night, call for members also to make an appeal for funds for the associations. 
also see that you secure your expenses and have money as a net to fill its prepared body whom you represent. You remain in town for one, two, or three days to work up a division or to visit a division, you should take the time to interview all the potential members in the community to get financial support for the organization so that the expenses of the trip will not only be on the meeting, but on the community from which, from whom you may get financial support. When getting people to join a division and elect officers, you should leave them you should leave with them that portion of the first month's dues that is the divisions, according to the constitutional law. Also leave them a portion of the proceeds to enable them to start out with something in their treasury. When setting up a new division, you should always advise them to rent a hall of their own where they will be able to hold their meetings without being disturbed. Suggest to them that they should not only depend on the regular monthly dues and collections to support the division, but they should organize entertainment of an innocent nature, such as dances, concerts, beauty contests, popularity contests, or any kind of social event on a regular basis to help bear the cost of the rental of the place. You should explain to them that from the very beginning, the division must make a regular monthly report to the parent body in accordance with the Constitution. You should point out to them and then mark those important sections of the Constitution that deal with the relationship between a division and the parent body. If you are a representative of the UNIA with credentials such as a commissioner of the state, you should raise funds in the following ways for the parent body which you represent. One, hold bazaars in the state. Two, picnics. Three, garden parties. Four, concerts. Five, or any general amusement that the public is accustomed to and would likely patronize for a call. Six, flower days, rose days, tag days, or self-denial days. If these functions are to take in the entire state, then ask all friends or divisions within the state to cooperate. When these events are held within the community, especially community, then ask all friends or divisions in that particular community to cooperate. This must only be done with previous arrangements with the parent body. A report to the parent body must accompany every such function. All these functions must be held in the name of the organization. You must also have groups of people in your jurisdiction organize house parties and give public entertainment for the benefit of the organization. A way to do this is to approach some responsible person on a street or in a neighborhood and ask him to invite his friends to his house for the party. If possible, you should always be present unless the person you have asked to the party is a reasonable and honest person who is in sympathy with your organization. If you arrange a tag day or flower day, this should be made of a private organization nature. If it was made public, it would be in conflict with certain municipal or state laws governing charities. <laughs> These things are to be organized within the organization and among its friends. You can appoint members of the organization, such as units of the Black Cross nurses, to go into people's homes and offices and ask them to buy a tag or a flower to help the cause. Oh, okay, that's what that's about. Do not think, do not have them do it publicly on the street. Do not have them do it publicly on the street, except in communities where you are privileged to do so. In organizing these things, always try to get interesting people to help who will take part in these activities for so the love of the cause and not for payment you can arrange with churches in your jurisdiction to stage plays at their church hall or in the church or on a percentage basis and then get local talent in your jurisdiction to contribute to the program free of cost in this way you will find yourself continuously active after you have done this thoroughly for a year, you will become acquainted with all the parties, and it will then be very easy for you to do the same thing annually. In such work, let every minute count, because if you appreciate all this, you will have no time for idleness. All, as far as white people are concerned, we do not specialize in seeking contributions from them, but where you think it is wise to arrange lectures among them, revealing only humanitarian part of the work, you may conduct such lectures and raise a collection or ask for help only on the humanitarian grounds. Do not commit yourself in any statement that would lead them to think that they could become members of your association or be affiliated with it or have any part in it. 
to do so will be a direct violation of the Constitution and against the association. This applies to the individuals of other races that you may ask to contribute to any special fund, but whenever such contributions have been made, a record should be kept of the person's name, address, and a report should be given to the headquarters with remarks made to show that the contributor's race Remarks made to show the contributor's race for the purpose of guiding the parent body to communications with such persons and then and in the future. Um, so last thing is the School of African Philosophy, College Yale. Those we must win, we shall win, we will win. And then the chorus, win, yes, win, and win to win. Second verse, you and I shall win to win. For Africa, for Africa, we win. We must win, we shall win, we will win. United chorus, win, yes, win, and win to win. For Africa, for Africa, we'll win to win. The last thing, uh, creed, the creed of goodness. To pass the time in doing good, to count the evil we put down, to have our deeds so understood is nobler than to wear a crown, to bless the people as we go, to, set, to scatter seeds that will grow to life, to strike all sin a deadly blow is better than to stir up strife. For this of all is greatest fame, that none on earth can error destroyed. Oh. To bless the people as we go to scatter seeds that go to life, to strike all sin and deadly blow is better than to stir up strife. But this is all but this of all is greatest thing that none on earth can ever destroy. Okay. Um, that completes the reading. Um, so, congratulations! Give yourself a round of applause. Uh, you completed the uh, reading for the study group exam. We'll follow up. Probably be we we'll try. I'm gonna try to do it this weekend just to get it out of the way. Saturday. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I uh, probably have like a four hour block of time. Um, just briefly, I wanna share with y'all that are here, my intentions for, for thoughts on the, the exam. Um, it's gonna be, I don't know how many questions or anything, it's gonna come from what we've reviewed, but um, it'll be two identical exams. Um, you'll get two sets of the exact same questions. And one of them I want you to do without any help, without any book or anything. I just wanna know what you know, and I want you to know what you know and what you don't know. And I want us to be honest about that. Uh, and then the second one will be open book, you know, um, you know, but yeah, it'll be two, you know, so if you don't know it off the top of your head, you don't know it, but be honest with yourself. Um, and then hopefully, you know, in a year or so, when we do this again, It'll be you'll have it in, uh, dedicated to memory by then. But that's the plan. Uh, I don't know how many questions. Um, I don't I really, you know, I don't know. But um, it'll be two. It'll be two part test. One will be what you know without any assistance, and then one will be open book. And I will be able to tell the difference. If you try to use the book on the first one. I will know. Any questions or comments before we uh, close? No, you did a great job, President John. Yes, sir. Excellent you, job, brother. Thank you, my brother. So, uh, now, now the book, bro, Everett, the I book, will... um, which book do, um, do I do I need to purchase? I, I was in that some some of the courses, but um, which book do I need to purchase? I like to buy books. So, um, message to the people, mm -hmm. of course, and ask okay, for message to the people. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, this study course would be everything that we're doing 
Well, 99% of what's going to be on the test is coming directly from this book, uh, Message to the People, of course, on African philosophy. Uh, we've been going over this about once a week uh, since about October, you know, or November. Uh, we're just now finishing it up. But um, all of these questions will come from Message to the People, of course, on African philosophy. Uh, other books that you should pick up, Race First by Dr. Tony Martin and um, Philosophies and Opinions. Yeah, I got both of those right there. Um, yeah, that's your, that's your foundation. That's, yeah, that's your foundation, those three books. Um, study that. You know, Race First is, is, a, is a challenge in itself. But if you study those those documents as well as the Constitution, you know, it won't be anything that I can tell you that you won't already know. Any other questions? No, sir. It was uh, um, um, a lot of insight. Thank you. So, yeah, don't don't stress too much about this exam thing. Just do the best you can. Um, it'll probably be graded on the curve, you know, depending on how everybody does. But and as far as time, I may do I may like do next week, and then I'll, for those that couldn't do it, well, I may do something this weekend. But for those that can't do it this weekend, uh, we'll do something next weekend as well. But I do want to get this finished and done with so I can communicate to Sister K what the expectations are for a high executive council. Sounds she wants to do a, um, I don't know if you're aware, President Everett, but um, Sister K wants to do a graduation ceremony for this course, the high executive oh, council. Wow. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. So yeah, next this weekend and next weekend, I want to try to get this exam put together. Um, set my set some time aside for myself, uh, and it'll kind of be like what we do right now. I have the conference line open, have the Zoom open, um, and you know, it'll just be a list of questions. Take your time. Have as much time you need. Got any questions? You know, I kind of help, but not too much. But uh, as Garvey said, Garvey gave us two quotes. Um, Garvey gave us two quotes when he put this course together. This is an introduction. So, you know, it's just something to keep in mind as we close out the last lesson. Um, Garvey gave two quotes to the people in Detroit in uh, 1937. And, we're, and, and we believe it's related to this course. But one of the quotes was, I have given them all I know. So there's nothing else. You know, it's, it's these 22 lessons. Well, it's 42 lessons, but it's 22 that are written. Um, and 20 that are unwritten, we got to kind of pull that. That's kind of lost to us at this point, the unwritten ones. Garvey has given us all that he knows um, in this book, and we've studied it. Uh, and his goal is to make everyone Marcus Garvey for sound fine. So, like I said, with the exam, relax. Uh, don't stress about it too much, because for me, the true test of Competency is not in the exam. It's, it's in our organization skills. And so if we really know this, um, we should we should be able to build a division of 500 members, no problem. And that's a true test of the knowledge. You know, it's not about who can answer these questions and who can remember this and that and these dates. It's about who can actually uh, you know, live the principles and and create the results. <clears throat> so, congratulations! You know, I hope y'all feel good and somewhat accomplished. 
uh, for getting through this. This is your first time. Um, there will be more times when you'll need to read through this book. It's not a one-time thing. But, you know, from Garvey's words, he's given us all he knows. He's trying to make us everyone in Garvey. Marcus Garvey personified. Um, these are not my words. It's not my lessons. I'm just here to provide the information. So, if there's nothing else, it's 1030, about an hour past our normal time. I appreciate everybody for staying on, um, but I do need to, you know, get out of here and find my wife before I go to sleep. Questions, comments before we move to close? No, nah, that was just a great, great book, great class. Great job, Brother John. Brother. All right, my brothers, um, I'm not going to hold y'all. Um, study up. Brother Everett, you do have the, uh, you got the digital book at least, right? I got, I got the, I got, um, I may have a digital too, but I do have the, um, I have the actual book. But I think one of I think I do have the digital book. I gotta look at it. I got a I got a bunch of digital books, but I've been reading it kind of. So that's why I'm not too sharp on it sometimes. So you do right, right, me. I just the book, though that we've been reading together sometimes. I think it was Brother James. Okay. Well I just I didn't if you needed some if your members needed a personal um, their own personal access. Um, that's what we had used for a long time was a digital one. Uh, if, if people didn't have a, a physical one, but, um, I was just gonna say, you know, obviously study that. Um, I may put out a study guide. Um, I'll probably put out a study guide tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm yeah. almost sure. Um, what's the uh, the brother that was in um the Atlanta division, thirteen. You know what I'm talking about. I forgot. Brother, I don't know. About thirteen. Yeah, that's that. He was going by thirteen, I think. Um, he did, writes books and stuff, but he he had jumped in one of our meetings and gave us a um a, a bunch of all um digital books. So I think I think we do have a digital book of it. So I, I I'll make sure the members know because I'm a lady okay. says book too. All right, I'm gonna work on like I said, I'm work on this study guide. Um, and this Saturday and then next Saturday we'll have time slots for uh, to, to to do the exam. Yeah, this this week cool. may be kind. Con- this week may be kind of tight just because I'm you only gonna have like a day, but I don't know. I mean, it ain't that, like don't stress about this stuff. Man. Like, if you can get it off, I just want to get it over with, like you said. You know, <laughs> the key thing, like I said, and, and, and I'm not trying to prove nothing to nobody. I don't want anybody to feel like they have to prove anything to me. This is not about you trying to validate, you know, um, your level of knowledge to me. Uh, this will be, this is more of a reflective uh, course. When we do the one, when you do the exam um, without the book, that'll let us both, you know, that'll let me and each of the individuals know where we really are. Right. And then we can we can do the second one just to feel good, like, oh, yeah, I got the right answers. But we got to know what's, what's real, what, where we really are without, you know, just on the spot. You're right, you're right. All right, my brothers, um, close out with the motto of the organization. Yeah, to me, one God. One God. One aim. One aim. One aim. One destiny. One destiny. One destiny. Right, as far as Africa. 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 For the Africans. For the Africans. Africans. Those at home. For those those at home. home. And those abroad. And those abroad. Those abroad. Race first, family. Race first. All right, y'all be safe.